Okay, so I'm quickly gonna, I have to arrange uh, the setup here. <clears throat> okay. Okay, now we have the problem again that is the font size okay here? I know um, for you, Chua, it may actually not, right? Uh, I don't know. Could you open a file? Is the same font as the left side? Yeah. If you could tweak it just a bit up, then it would be great. Just like. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Maybe it works today. No, it does not. Um, can you try again that action menu? Which one? The command shift A. And then hit the increase font size. It's the third option. Oh my God. Just okay. do it one more, one more time. Yeah, it opened the freaking Mac OS. Oh, then then you have to, I can change the, the fix for that later when it's not working. No, it's okay now. It's okay. We have it's it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um yeah, so the project right now, as you know, is hosted on, on GitHub and it's basically one repository, one git repository. It's a very, I would say, basic um go project. It's scaffolded actually from a template, which is provided by HashiCorp. So it's called, I think, Terraform Provider Scaffold, where you can look at and you have like a very minimal Terraform provider. Um, so a lot of things are coming from there. Um, for example, make files, um, the basic test setup, I think. And yeah, I mean, I think, best would be to look at some very basic resource and some very basic data source and see how this is how this is working and then we can also see how the provider itself is configured like how this is working with the, the GitLab client um, and if you have any like comment or question yeah, please interrupt me anytime um, yeah so maybe for the sake of familiarity, we can look at the GitLab cluster agent resource, which um, you know obviously talks to the API for the cluster agents. And the, I mean, I, I assume, and you need to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I assume you know how how a resource looks like in ter in, in HCL. So it will be something like this, right? Let me try again the, the, the increase font size. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> you would have in your Terraform code to use that. You would have a resource declaration. You have your GitLab cluster agent, give it a name, and then you have some attributes they are called in, in Terraform. Mm -hmm. And these attributes, they can be um, required or they cannot be required. Um, if they're required, it's called an argument, which for example, here we have two of those. We have a project and we have a name because a cluster agent always must have a project and a name. And this is test code. We can go into this later, but I just wanted to show how this looks like so that we can make the, the connection. And the first thing you do in a provider is register all your data sources and resources to the provider, which is created by, uh, by Terraform. And how you do this is you have this schema resource here, which is just a type, and it can have a few um, like functions registered. Um, these are CRUD functions usually. So you have a create function, a read function, an update function, which we don't have for this particular resource, and we have a delete function. And those are being called by the Terraform um, machinery depending on if the resource has to be created newly, if it has to be updated, if it only has to be read, or if it has to be deleted. And they, this is where all the, like the business logic of the 
resources of the provider go. What's also here is the importer. And the importer is called when you run Terraform import and import a state or a, like a, a resource into the state of Terraform so that it can be managed. Usually what you want to have is a pass through importer. Um, we can get to this later what that is. But now here, um, this is pretty important. It's the schema of the, of the resource. So it defines what attributes are there, which are required, what type they are, and so on. We can quickly check here what that looks like. So it's basically a map which maps strings to um, schemas. So here we already see the what I showed before. We have a project required attribute, which is called an argument. It has a description. It has a type. Here also it has a forced new flag. And this forced new flag is if, um, if you do an update to this particular attribute, Terraform will delete the resource and recreate it instead of doing an update. And in this particular case, I told you that it doesn't have an update function. So all the attributes which you can set as a user actually need to be set as force new because it cannot update, right? It will be a Terraform provider bug if you do, don't do this. And actually, I think it's being caught. Um, I don't think by the compiler, but you will notice very early. Yeah, that's a project. Um, we also have the name. And then what we also have is a few of these attributes which are computed. Um, these are not for the user to set, but these are being populated by the provider so the user can access it inside their Terraform HCL code. So we populate an ancient ID once it's created. There's a created at uh, date time, and there's also a user ID of the creator. Is so far so good? Okay. Um, now the <clears throat> this this business logic, right? The CRUD functions of the resource. So here you already see we have so one one question from the previous. Mm -hmm. So for the ones that it forces to true, mm -hmm. it will expect to have the delete method to use that you have set up a delete method and then yes. it calls the delete method before. Yes, exactly. And this is being done and evaluated by the the ter by Terraform itself. So maybe um, the Terraform provider. You basically, or you merely provide hooks for Terraform itself to, to call some functions depending on their reconciliation logic or like their state machinery. Um, yeah. And actually here, the force new, it applies for the entire resource, right? It's not that this applies only for like the project attribute or, or anything like this. This is always meant to replace the entire resource if this attribute changes, which can, which doesn't make a lot of sense here. If you think about this, that it would only replace the project attribute, but it makes sense if you have um, like a sub resource inside a resource, we can look at such an example um, later. Um, but yeah, uh, let's continue with this. So we, we see the functions here. So here's the create function. We have the read function, the delete function, and here's some, some helpers and um, the create functions here, the code always looks very, very similar from resource to resource. And here, the first thing we do is from some argument here, we get a GitLab client, which is an instance of this Go GitLab um, client library. And it also, it already has authentication, everything set up so that we can just uh, call um, API endpoints. And what we do next is, I mean, what you're getting here actually is this, this D, it's usually called D, the variable, um, and it's of type resource data. And this contains, it's, it's complex or complicated to, to, to explain because it, it, sometimes it's what is in the Terraform plan, sometimes it's what's in the state, and sometimes it's what's in the config. Depending on the situation where this resource data is being used. Um, in the create case, there is no state yet, right? Because we're creating the resource. So it, it comes from, it comes from the, the config, right? Which the user um, wrote, like the one we saw in the, in the test case here. 
Um, so the resource data type has these attributes in there and we can, we can fetch those by using this get method here, provide the key for the attribute, which is project in this case. And we, um, we cast it to the proper type we need. And then we basically set up the, the options for the, for the GitLab library, the client library. So this is quite specific to that. And then um, here we make the actual call to GitLab to register the agent, given our options, which we populated here for the, the project. And <clears throat> once this happened, um, we build an ID for the resource. This is important to, um, well, every resource needs an ID. You can set this to pretty much everything, but by you know best practice and because that's the only way it works consistently is that it has to be unique for that resource. So that's why you construct here a string based on the project and the cluster ID, uh, cluster agent ID, because that's that's unique. And and then we we own and this here you see the 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 thing. Um, I told you before that this D represents the plan basically, right? What the user um, set into their config, but then on the same object, we basically set data and this is going to be in the state afterwards. And there is a new provider framework. It's called the framework and not the SDK. And there, this is separate. So that's like one differentiation between these versions, but here it's the same thing. And you can't really tell from the types what it's supposed to be, um, which can be confusing at sometimes here. It's, quite okay. And right now we only have the, the ID for this resource in the state. So we want to have every attribute in the state. So we actually want to have all of these inside the state. And we could actually just do this here. We could do set name equal to, um, well, I'm just sketching it here to this option name. And then it will go into the um, into the state, but for many reasons, um, I'll get to those. We actually call the read function here and the read function will read the ID here. You see it, it will read the ID. It get a, it gets a project and an agent ID. So basically what we, um, provided it here and we're going to get the agent from GitLab again, and only then we're going to populate the state with the data returned from GitLab. And this is what's happening in this, these two lines. And uh, we can quickly go into this, but it's not very interesting. Here we have just have a map, which is then represented in the state. So we, we set the project name. It's pretty much everything, which is up here. And we do this because we, we want to use only one place where we set the state, which is this read function. And I told you before about this pass through importer and how an import works is that you basically say, um, this, this would be like your shell command here. You would do something like this, um, terraform import, um, GitLab cluster agent this, and then here you provide your project ID colon agent ID. And what this pass through importer does is, or what Terraform does is it's calling the importer of this provider because it knows the resource and of this resource, sorry. And it calls this pass through importer and this will take the ID or set the ID pretty much the same as we do in the create here and then just call the read function. So this means that we use the same logic for an import and for the create, which gives so it's kind of the consistency you want to have inside a resource, right? We don't want to have multiple ways. So that's why we, um, we use this pass through importer and that's why we call the read here, for example, in the create. So far, so good. Does it make sense? Okay. And then the delete, um, pretty much the same thing. We read the ID again from the state and we just call the delete endpoint on GitLab and that's it. We don't have to clear the state that's all handled by Terraform itself. Um, yeah, so that's a very simple resource. 
it can get much com more complex and much bigger. We have thousand lines of resource code, which is horrible, but um, that's how it is right now. Um, regarding testing, this may also be kind of interesting. So um, <clears throat> how we test is we test against a uh, GitLab instance always. And usually when I develop locally, this may be a, a container where GitLab is running also in the pipeline uh, on GitHub Actions at the moment, it's spawning a Docker Compose and running um, GitLab in there and we test against it. And um, what it does is it's actually like we're <clears throat> here, this is a basic test. Um, we create a project in kind of a setup manner. Um, and then the, the SDK provides us a, like a testing framework and here we can have test steps and we can provide some HCL code here in like a config um, attribute. So this is basically set up code for a test step inside an entire test. And then we can add check functions, which check the state afterwards or do any kind of assertions for this config. And it will also handle a few things for us, this SDK testing stuff. So it tests, for example, if this is applied, it will apply it again, or it checks the plan after the apply and checks if the plan is empty. And if not, for example, you get an error because then you could always apply and make changes, which is not what you want, it's probably a bug. So it, these kind of things, it helps you. It also has some stuff to import. We do this pretty much after every test step. Um, just to verify if stuff can can be imported, and it actually um, it verifies that um, the computed attributes are all set properly. But yeah, this is also like very detail detaily uh, the reasons why we do this and all kinds of these things so may not be worth to remember. But so I have a question, just curious. Sure. Uh, resource dot uh, test parallel or something. In the test file, yeah, parallel test. What what actually happens concurrently here? I just don't see. Um, this test happens parallel to all other resource parallel tests inside this entire test suite. So in this is this is linear or see in sequence, mm -hmm. but it runs concurrently with this test. How is that? How is that possible? Um, I mean, they are inside of Go tests, and Go tests run sequentially, as you know. No, I mean you can you, even in in Go tests you can run like this parallel. Yeah, right? yes, I know, but we yeah, don't do yeah. this here. I yeah, it, it does looks that for like us. It. Yeah, it does that for us. Yeah. Oh, okay then. Okay. Yeah, then yeah. I, see. It, it, I think it's it's based on. So you ah, see it here. Okay, then that makes yeah. sense. It just wraps it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Then it makes sense. Cool. Yeah. But it's it's like actually the tests take a long time because we're actually querying GitLab instances, right? So we wanted to bring that time down a little bit with these parallel tests, and this has been successful so far. But there is tests which are changing. Um, a global instance-wide configuration. So we cannot run everything in parallel. And also with data sources, we can actually look at the data source now, explain the something regarding its testing there. So are you ready to move on to a data source? To see how that looks like? Okay, we, we can look at the same uh, API endpoint. Um, and here, <clears throat> this is kind of a newer resource. So we have not so much code duplication, but usually you have a lot of duplication between resources and data sources because the SDK doesn't provide anything to us. And just historically in this code base, everything has just been duplicated. So, yeah, but I wanted to reduce this a little bit in the past. So that's why I put this schema out of the resource and made, made it reusable inside a data source. So here you register the data source and maybe also look at the HCL again before we go into that. So we have this data, we give it a name and we can query um, 
one agent in this case, given a project and an agent ID. And we also, I mean, for we are, it's the same from the SDK perspective. If you notice the types here, it's the same thing, a data source and a resource. It's just the data source case, it just has a read function. There's no create, there's no delete because it's just reading, right? It's a data source. So it's just consuming data. And it also has a schema. The schema is the same thing for resources and data sources, but, and it's also something I would complain about in this SDK is that you can set all the attributes in the schema um, for a data source, but which are actually only ever used for a resource. So you can have a forced new attribute inside the schema of a data source, which absolutely doesn't make any sense, but you can have it for some reason. And this is sometimes, it can be confusing. At least it has led to bugs in the past. So yeah, I, I, I hope it's better in the new uh, framework, but it's just something that you have to be aware of. So from the coding perspective, a resource and the data source, are essentially the same thing, but the data source is like a downstream kind of resource. <clears throat> um, yeah, and then here uh, we have this read function, and it just it does pretty much the same thing as the um, as the resource did, right? It just gets an agent and, and does some stuff. Uh, the logic, though, <laughs> funny enough, it's not exactly the same. Um, so you can look at. The read here again, you see also how, how it's handling some stuff here differently than it does here. So yeah, I'm sure we could handle this a little bit better but in the sake of uh, simplicity. Why do we need to have it as a data source and as a resource? Why do we need both? Um, you mean from, from our perspective? I mean, you need both because sometimes you don't want to create the resource because it's created outside of Terraform or whatever. So you just want to query stuff. Right? And so that's just uh, because of how Terraform implements things on yes. the, their, their language side, then yes. that we need to have a data source to be able to just read. Yes, exactly. I mean, there is users um, using this provider who don't have everything as infrastructure as code or in Terraform. They do some setup manually, and then they want to use that inside of Terraform without having Terraform own it, right? Because once you create something with Terraform, it's meant to only be changed from within Terraform. If you change it outside of Terraform, you have a drift, right? You have a kind of a misalignment that Terraform will complain about this. And so, so yeah, if you don't have everything in infrastructure as code for historical reasons, or you have another good reason, um, you, you won't have data source. And also some API endpoints are just read-only endpoints, like, like the license, for example, these kind of things. Um, so there, there is data sources which do, or API endpoints, which you can only read from, but not. So when you create a resource, then that uh, those methods like create and delete, they are mandatory. You need to. Yeah, yeah. So. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The create is mandatory, the read is manda mandatory, and the delete is mandatory. The update is the only one which is not mandatory. And just because you can solve an update by replacing, so deleting and recreating. But sometimes, actually, and this is like a, a shortcoming in the GitLab API as well, for example, protected branches, I don't know how it is these days, but protected branches settings, they couldn't be updated with the API, only deleted and recreated. And as you can imagine, if I replace this, there is a short amount of time where the branch is unprotected. So there is like a security risk doing this kind of things, but um, yeah, so there is like you have, depending on what you do, you might want to consider actually implementing an update. Instead of saying, ooh, I don't need an update, I can just replace the object. Yeah, you can, but there is impact. You have to be aware of. Um, yeah, so that's the data source. Um, regarding testing, <clears throat> I mentioned the parallel test before. Um, let's see, look at another resource. There's this GitLab cluster agents. 
which queries all the agents for a project. It, it's not specific to one agent, so you just want to maybe have a list of agents for some reason. And if you do this, and if you test this, um, you, we are basically creating here, in this case, 25 agents. And we want the data source here to return 25 agents. So if another test is running in parallel, which creates an agent, it may be a problem. In this particular case, it's not a problem because it's isolated of a project, but there's, for example, users, right? Users are kind of global. So if I have this data source here, the, oops, here, the GitLab, um, yeah, this GitLab users, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's here. Um, if you have this GitLab users, you you can't, if you want to expect a certain amount of users, um, you can't have another test creating a user, right? Because it would change the amount of users available in the instance. Yeah. Um, any questions? Okay, I mean, we, we're using here in the provider, we're using this Go GitLab li library, which is using the REST API. And this has been a problem at certain points um, because GitLab claims to be GraphQL first. So for some endpoints, the REST API is just lacking behind. And we had made an attempt to use GraphQL inside uh, the provider. And we have actually one resource, just looking at where it is. I think it's the current user. Yeah, here, um, where we actually use GraphQL, you can see the, the query here. Um, we have to define some types and everything because we are not using a library, we're just using like plain GraphQL. Um, but I, I'm not yet convinced that that's the right way because GraphQL is nice if you have like dynamic queries and you want to change them and you don't really know upfront. But for the provider, we know upfront very well and it's everything. We want to read everything and we want to mod or be able to modify everything. So the, 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 all the benefits of GraphQL, they don't really apply for us. But the impact is that we lose a lot of typing stuff, um, like here. It's super easy to do, just like a typo here. and No one will notice. Um, but also, you don't have much alternative. Otherwise, you have to implement some API endpoint, REST yes. API endpoints. Right? So yes. You exactly. have to apply it. Exactly. And that's what I did the last year. <laughs> I implemented REST API endpoints for stuff that wasn't available, but I, I see how this cannot be the way forward. Um, if this GraphQL, I mean, Graph, GraphQL first, I think is still the plan, but I think the aim is to have parity in the REST API. But in practice, I've seen this not happening. I mean, stuff is just implementing GraphQL for whatever reason, right? And this may be okay. It's just in the provider, it has been a pain um, in the past. So if we can elab, like refine how we do this with GraphQL here, maybe type it a little bit better, maybe, I don't know what yet, but if we can make a solid fundamentals with this uh, GraphQL stuff, it may be like a good second citizen inside the provider um, next to the Go GitLab REST API client. <clears throat> so yeah, these are resources, data sources. Um, the provider itself, it looks quite similar to a resource actually. There's this new function and which is called by, uh, I think, the, yeah, the, the, by, by Terraform, or we call it, I think, somewhere. When we very instantiate the plugin, we call this new thing. 
Um, it returns a provider, and here again, you see this schema, which is the same thing for, <laughs> for resources, data sources, and the provider. And here is basically what you would, um, the attributes you define when you instantiate the provider inside HCL, inside your Terraform configuration. And then there is like this configure method, which is being called when the provider is then really instantiated, which is actually not when you declare it. So how Terraform instantiates a provider is when the when it's first being used with a data source or resource. So it's not that if you run Terraform apply, it would first instantiate all the providers and then basically apply the resources and data sources. It basically instantiates the providers lazily whenever they're necessary. So here we have this hook, this configure hook, um, and it configures the client here, creates the client. Um, it sets some user agent and everything. And yeah, <clears throat> it's, it's pretty simple here. Um, maybe good to know is also that a provider runs as a single process next to Terraform itself. So, it's not loaded inside of, of the Terraform process or something like that, but it's uh, executable, spawned by Terraform, being communicated through gRPC. And, but we don't see any of this like communication framework with gRPC in the provider itself. It's all handled by the SDK. So we really only have to implement those hooks and that's it. The schema, the hooks, that's pretty much it. And, and how, how is that binary built? Yes. So <clears throat> um, there is a make file here. Um, we just run go build. <laughs> and that's, that's building the binary. Um, so let me see. Um, yeah, we, I mean, you, we, we don't use like Basil or any, any other additional tool chain. We just use, um, um, yeah, plain Go tooling, but we're, we're using Go releaser to release for all the platforms and everything because it's released for all, all possible platforms, right? So we have FreeBSD, Windows, Linux, and uh, Mac in all those architectures even build it for 32 bit but yeah um these binaries are also signed and then i briefly talked to you michael this morning about how this is deployed but maybe to recap um the pipeline <clears throat> or go releaser actually creates a github release similar to the gitlab release and attaches these binaries there and there's a webhook inside uh, GitHub configured, which calls the Terraform registry that there is a new release. And it will come back to GitHub, look at the release. It fetches the boundaries we've built and attached the release, uses those for, if you do like, if you if a user configures the provider, it will download these boundaries. And additionally, <laughs> it, it actually uses the docs because there's documentation online on the Terraform registry for the provider. Um, and we can go into documentation after. Uh, it's quite interesting also. And it uses those from the source code, I believe. It just queries the doc directory and uses that. So um, yeah, this is also why we probably why we have to have a bridge between if we migrate to GitLab, you need to have a bridge to GitHub so that the Terraform registry stuff works which is quite, it sucks kind of, but yeah, that's how it is. Did that answer your question with, with how it's being built? Okay. Um, yeah, one more question. Could you show me the main uh, yes. package and main function, please? Just curious <clears throat> how that. Yeah, so that's the main when it's being spawned and there we have this, uh, this plugin thing here and you see here this provider new function. It's the one I've I've shown before, where it yeah it, it returns a provider here. Schema provider which has a schema schema for the provider configuration, 
and it just serves this. And this project uses Go modules. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because when I looked at it, my some years ago, it was before Go, Go modules. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that there's, I mean, I took some, like a year ago, I updated a lot of things here to be a little bit more modern. Also updating the, the, the SDK, you know, introducing things like contexts and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, there is some resources are very old and you can tell <laughs> from the code and we may or may not update them in the future, but yeah, you will you will stumble across a few things where you're like, wow, why? why? But yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> um, regarding documentation. So if you look at the data sources and resources, they have a description, which is markdown. Um, and also all the attributes, they have a description and a type and everything, and all these flags. And there is a tool called you see that make file, uh, I don't know. It's TF plugin docs, which generates documentation, markdown documentation from this, um, oh, from these uh, markdown data inside Go. So this is the single source of truth, the source code here. In the documentation, there's also examples. And how this works is for every um, resource, you have a folder, for example, here for the, the cluster agent and there is always a import sh file and the resource tf file and it's terraform file you um you just do examples whatever you want and in the import you make an example how to import this is the command i scratched before for the import and those are being taken and generated inside the docs and there's also a resource folder and in here you have a markdown file for all the resources. <clears throat> so here you already see it's generated by this Terra TF plugin docs thingy. And the example here, so that's actually copy pasted from the resource TF file I showed in the example before. And this part here is taken from the import sh file from the examples. So the examples directory and the, the Go um, descriptions and everything there um, is being combined into this markdown file we see here and this then is being taken by uh, the HashiCorp Terraform uh, infrastructure whatever they have in place to populate their website with documentation yeah um, what else is there I mean, there, there is some, some scripting stuff, which is mainly there to set up the GitLab instance for testing. So it you can, I mean, th there is some setup um, inside the GitLab RB file, for example, to, to enable SAML support, to enable um, the registry and so on. So you can do proper testing for a few features. Um, there's also things like, um, for example, here we create a admin token which we use uh, during testing. That's a shortcoming at the moment that all the tests use this admin token for authentication. So we don't really do testing like, um, can a maintainer use this particular resource? Right, we kind of missed that completely, which has led to a few issues in the past as well. Um, yeah, regarding how we release, we didn't document any of these processes, I think, so far. But it's as easy as creating a tag in Git and push it. And then, you know, GitHub Actions take off and go release or runs. It creates a GitLab release entry, a change. Actually, the change log has to be handcrafted at the moment. It's this file here. And for, like, there is a format provide or yeah, specified by HashiCorp how to how to name these things, <clears throat> what to put this, what to put here. Yeah. 
what else do we have? Well, we yeah, there's also a topic we've discussed many times in the past regarding testing. And this is the, we have an enterprise instance for testing as well. So we test against um, the last three GitLab versions. That's what we support officially, but you can use probably much older um, GitLab um, releases for certain resources. But we officially test against the last three and we test, we test always against a CE instance and an EE instance. And the EE has an ultimate license. And we somehow need to have this license available for testing. And it's actually a security risk at the moment that someone can actually obtain this license if they're clever enough. It's a license which is being valid, I think, for three months. We have, an, we have it encrypted in here in the, in the source code. And there's a secret inside GitHub Actions or in GitHub, and it's in, in the GitHub Actions, it's being decrypted and used for the instance. But I told you that all tests have this admin token. So they have that and they can run tests, um, like they can run arbitrary code inside the test. So you would be able to get out the license again. Right, if you're clever enough. But then again, it's not that clever because you have it for three months. And if you want to have a free instance, you can remove the check, you know, the e checking code from the Ruby stuff. And so we, we decided that that's a fair or a good enough solution together with GitLab security team. Um, but we may also reconsider this and uh, when, we, when we move to GitLab, um, how, how we can protect the license there. Mm, yeah. I can imagine that uh, this project probably covers integration tests that we don't have. And uh, you might have found the issues in the past that uh, we, we didn't find. Maybe you found it, the project. I mean, you mean in general or in configure team? Or configure no, I mean in general, because oh, yeah, you I have mean... uh, so many APIs and you're running against yeah, a yeah, real I mean, instance. I mean, for, I mean, I filed, the last year I filed many issues with bugs. I fixed many issues with bugs or like missing implementation. Yeah. But I think <clears throat> it's a good point actually that you raised this. I opened the issue a few months ago. It's labeled like that behavior of the API is not documented at all or in 99% of the cases. And this is actually a huge issue for us because when you create a resource and the API returns, what does that mean? Does that mean that the resource has been created? Does it mean that the resource is usable? Does it mean that the resource, maybe it's not even created. Maybe it spawned off an async process inside GitLab and it just returned with an ID. So we have a lot of code in the provider where we, where we account for these things, like waiting for a group to actually be ready and usable after it's being created because we found weird behavior that for example if you when you create a group it returns an id and results and then you do an immediate get afterwards and the group is not found which people we don't really know why this is it may have to do with like replications and that database whatever it's it's a very weird behavior but it happens so all of these kind of issues you run into <laughs> regularly. And it's so hard to debug these because there's no documentation. So what I've been doing is browsing around GitLab source code, figuring out where it dispatches async stuff. And yeah, if you develop on this, you will run into these kind of issues all the time. And yeah, it's it, it, there's also configuration for this. Like for example, group, you, when you delete the group, um, you can have a, a deletion delay. I don't know if you know if you know that. Um, but like, what's the right behavior there for the delete function? Should we wait for the delete? Should we not wait? Maybe it's set to seven days. Is it okay if it just triggers a de delay deletion, or do you really want to wait for a deletion because it's set to two minutes? Right? Or what is the? You, you don't really know. Do you provide? Do you provide attributes for this? And actually. The Terraform provider um, best practices mentioned that you should 
limit yourself to API features. So in the best case, you just replicate or you, the, the provider is just a pass through to the API without any additional logic. So we are kind of hesitant to implement workarounds to make stuff work, implement fictional attributes to, let's say, wait for deletion of a group and these kind of things. So it's, it's like, it technically, the Go code and everything, it's super easy. But the thing around it and what the user expects, what the API provides, what GitLab does in the background, it's, it's, an, it's a big topic, right? And it's difficult to, to balance all these things. Right? Um, this is also where it's interesting, I would say, um, most of the times. Sometimes it's just fucked up and you're just like, why, why did this happen? But yeah, I can show you an example how this looks like from a Go perspective when we have to do such a thing. Um, for example, in the, in the project, this is an enormous resource. You see here, this is a project resource. Right? It's kind of quite big. And <clears throat> in the create, there's also a lot of plumbing, um, I have to say. But yeah, for, for example here, <clears throat> That's that particular code, just to make an example, that particular code is here um, to wait for the default branch to be protected when you create a project. So when you create a project with the API and initialize it with a readme, it will create a branch. It will protect it, but it will do this async. So do you want to wait for this? Turns out people want to wait for this um, because also um, you may want to change the settings for the default branch protection. And now we actually have a very, this is a very interesting scenario, which is currently unsolved and unsupported by the SDK. So if you have a resource in Terraform, it's being owned by Terraform. We have a resource GitLab project and we have a resource GitLab branch protection where you use the branch protection API to set up a protection for a branch. This will be owned by GitLab, uh, by, by the Terraform provider. Now, if you create a project, it may create a branch protection, but you cannot change this using Terraform out of the box because you would have to import it first because it's not owned by Terraform. So what do you do, right? It's it's and all these this is so difficult to first to understand what is actually happening here if you have a bug like this which we had right so yeah we <laughs> what we did is um we we added a flag in the branch protection which allows to basically overwrite the default branch protection even if it already exists because it may have a May have, it may have been created out of bounds of the Terraform provider, right? So it may have been a side effect of some other resource which has been created. And this is like, if it gets difficult, these are the things which are difficult, right? This is why there is, yeah, code in here, uh, which, you, which, which you may think like, what is this? Why do we have to wait for branch protection to be, to be there? Yeah. Um, any any questions or any thoughts or ideas or whatever? <clears throat> um, I have a question. So what uh, what is the number one thing that you would like to improve here in this project? Um, there's a few organizational things I would like to do, like migrating to GitLab and these kind of things. But number one thing, <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's one number one, but it certainly is one, is that um, I mentioned the code duplication and it doesn't look like a lot. It's still cumbersome. If you write a resource, why do I have to do this again for a data source if I... I have it, I basically almost have it in the resource. Why can't I just reuse it and make a data source out of it? So it would be very nice to have some 
automatic way to create a, res a data source out of a resource. I have a few doubts why that may not be possible, which also prevented me from doing this in the past. But since you are all here and it's not only my brain at work, maybe you can figure something out. Um, this would be this would be very nice. Um, I would also love to see the test time going down a little bit because it takes for the entire test suite to run or like it runs in parallel, but for one like item in the test matrix, it's like 25 minutes. Um, maybe you can reduce this by maybe focusing more on unit tests. But as you see here, what do you want to unit test really? Right. So, yeah. So maybe you can figure something out there as well. <clears throat> also, organizationally, which I would love to see is what I mentioned before, having people in GitLab documenting the behavior of things for API endpoints, for example, because it's so valuable for users, not only for the provider, but for users to, to know, okay, this API endpoint actually triggers an async operation. And it actually comes only back to you immediately with some ID, but make sure it's not ready yet. Like call this API endpoint to check if it's ready. Like these kind of things, right? It would be super, it would save so much time. And just for people to be um, cautious about what people may use the API for and make it complete. If you have a create and maybe also implement an update and a delete, because it takes so much time for someone else to go in and provide the delete um, API, if it would just have been like another 10 minutes for someone who implemented the create and update and read, right? So I, I don't want to force this to, <laughs> to anyone in GitLab, right? But I think just to make, just to, just to be more aware that actually people are using this and they may need more information than just um, the docs page. And also, I talked about this with Mikhail this morning as well. It would be nice to have some open API spec, for example, for the REST API. Um, because, so maybe that's also on the list. What I w would love to see is a solution for the Go GitLab library maintenance, because it's Sander doing this and He's alone doing this. I, I've contributed a lot there. And for GitLab, I understand that GitLab cannot maintain libraries for every language out there. But we're using Go like heavily in this provider. We also use, we make use of the REST API in the agent, right? Or in the, uh, in COS, um, using the REST API. So maybe you can also use it there. I don't know, but. Yeah, we use, we have our own client. Yeah, which, so maybe, which is, yeah, maybe not, it makes sense to consolidate, right? Uh, maybe, but so I looked at the Go GitLab client that is used here uh, mm -hmm. several years ago, and it was very specific uh, for this project, and uh, it kind of mm -hmm. didn't make sense to make it more generic. So it is very simple here. And that is mm -hmm. the specificity for this project. It is kind of it's not worth to like force everybody to use the same the same thing, mm -hmm. I think, in this particular case. Okay. Oh hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but I think it, it makes sense to at least there's an open issue. There has been discussion around it, but I don't ha I haven't seen any resolution. Even if the resolution is from a GitLab organization perspective, we don't want to maintain this. Um, but let's see if Sander grants maintainer permissions to one of us at least, so that we can fulfill our own needs in time or in a timely manner. I don't know. Let's let's see. Maybe something nice can come out of this. Yeah, we also have a GitLab client in uh, GitLab shell, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Gitali uses that, I think, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe somewhere else as well. So, but 
I'm not sure it's worth trying to consolidate everything because they are kind of specialized for the project and there's not much kind of mm -hmm. uh, useful logic that is kind of duplicated. No, it's just like yes. plumbing around the standard libraries package, basically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I see that. I see that. Makes sense. But yeah, at least have some resolution for for the, the state of maintenance for the COVID lab library. Would be nice. I think Sonder would also be happy if someone would support him. <laughs> but yeah, but let's see. Okay. Anything else? We are anyway. Thanks, Timo. This was uh, really good. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, thank I, you. I hope, I hope that we can, you know, move forward with this as a team a little bit more than uh, just me doing it alone. Uh, it would be super nice. One thing that uh, occurred to me, this uh, resembles a lot the situation that we have with the, we have the import group in GitLab. It's another team. Uh -huh. And their job is to uh, uh, basically implement the feature to export GitLab's repositories, features, all that, and import it somewhere else or import it from GitHub to GitLab. Mm -hmm. So all these features that are related to Git, importing GitLab instance and exporting. Mm -hmm. And they are always like running behind and trying to catch up with new things that have been implemented. And um, yeah, they have their own standards of coding and, and they also struggle with things that they think if people would just like do this always when they implement a feature, then it would facilitate our work so much. And I think there is even parts of the documentation on our handbook for developing mm -hmm. that asks us to have this into consideration and gives us some hints. Okay. I wonder if there is something that we can do similarly and even maybe just schedule a chat with them too, because there might be learnings there because it is similar. Uh -huh. Like in the yeah. sense that uh, we are always trying to yeah. keep up with what has been added to the instance. Yeah, yeah that's good to know. I also um, added or contrib contributed a few things to the API style guide um, to add these kind of, you know, please document this and that, you know, uh, in a more structured way so that you can find the information easily. Yeah, yeah that's cool. It's good to know. Also, I, I think a lot of, or at least a few teams I know of in GitLab actually use the provider to test their stuff. I don't know who this is. I may follow up. I think this guy, this guy's name is Anthony or something. But he posted a few issues on, on, on GitHub uh, to the provider and was like, yeah, we, we use this to test issue boards, these kind of things. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.